We're going. Should have been gone now because I'm trying to figure out what I say next. Mike's alive. Mike's alive. Good evening. <laughs> Same time. We will now call the uh, Personnel Administration Affairs Committee to order at 7 p.m. October 1st, 2018. Will the clerk please call the roll? Alderman Karen. Here. Alderwoman Shoshana Kelly. Here. Alderman at large Lori Wilshire is here. Alderman Tom Lopez. Here. Alderman Ken Gidge. Here. Also with us tonight is Alderman, Alderwoman Marianne Melissa Goya and Alderman Harriet Gathright. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so do we have any uh, public comment? None? Okay. Okay, so Mr. Mayor, would you like to come up? And um, we see that Hunt Memorial trustees, Caroline Montalero has withdrawn her appointment. So um, is Terry Romano with? Right here, thank you. Okay. The floor is yours, Mayor. Um, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I am uh, here to introduce you to uh, Terry Romano, who uh, I am nominating to be on the Hunt Memorial Building Board of Trustees. Uh, Terry has been a longtime resident of Nashua. Recently, she uh, left the city for a short time, but now has moved back. She lives uh, down by at, uh, Falls. at the Jackson Falls uh, condominiums. Uh, she's been very involved in many, many activities uh, in Nashua over the years. Um, Friends of Greeley Park, uh, the Historical Society, Friends of the Hunt Memorial Building, uh, the Boys and Girls Club as a director, Home Health and Hospice as a director, the Humane Society as a director. Uh, she loves Nashua. She's been very um, dedicated to the community, as I said, for a for long, long time. And uh, I think she will tell you that, uh, you know, she regards the Hunt Building as a real treasure for the city and would very much like to be involved in making sure that it, uh, it, it is preserved and thrives uh, in the future. Thank so you. with that, I give you, you uh, Ms. Romano. Thank, Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for nominating me. Thank uh, you. Hello, everyone. My name is Terry Romano, and I live at 52 Main Street, Nashua, New Hampshire. I have lived in this city happily for many years, but I wanted to have a change of climate for a while, and so I moved to a warm climb. But I miss Nashua terribly. It's my beloved Nashua. And I have many, many friends here who are so wonderful to me. And I just couldn't stay away. So I decided to return, even though it's cold in the winter, and that I would, <laughs> I would um, be happier here than anywhere else. And so I bought a condo, and I'm um, at peace again and ready to be of service to the city of Nashua in any way that I can be. As the mayor uh, indicated, I've been on many boards as a director. I've been president of many of the boards also. And so I'm prepared to do what I can to be of service in every way possible. And do excuse my voice shaking, I'm a little nervous. And so, uh, I find that the Hunt Memorial Building, uh, which I first saw many years ago, I thought it was a beautiful, beautiful little gem. And I walked in one day, and I saw Mary Goyette sitting there <laughs> with uh, the late B. Cadwell, who was very active in the city and who subsequently I dealt with for many years at the Nashua Historical Society. And so they graciously gave me a tour of the hunt. And I said, what a gorgeous 
building. And um, being a history major in college, I wanted to know everything I could about it, and they uh, were happy to tell me. And then Marie Goyette said, Terry, would you like to be a hostess here for the different functions? And so for several years, I did that, and I attended different um, functions at least once a week. And so uh, I got to know the building quite well. And then different boards asked me to join them on as a director or as a trustee. And so I uh, dedicated myself to nonprofits. And now at this time in my life, I'd like to dedicate myself to my wonderful <coughs> city of Nashua. I rest my <laughs> summation. <laughs> Thank you. You are not in charge. No. All right. <laughs> Any question? Any questions? Alderman Wilson. I don't have a question, but you know, you do say that the hunt is a gem, and I believe you are a gem. And thank, thank you so you. much for stepping up and and being willing to serve in this capacity. Thank you. I, for one, appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else, Mary? Mm, it's Melissa Gall. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, I just. I um, want to thank the mayor for, for making this nomination. Um, I was thrilled to see Terry um, this summer and find out she was back in town. And as she's told you, she's been involved with many boards, both um, public and private, in the city and is truly committed to the city. And um, when she expressed an interest in the Hunt Board of Trustees, I was like, oh, that would be wonderful. And I think she brings with her not only her appreciation of the history and, um, and, and what the Hunt building is as a building, but she also brings um, her knowledge of finances and um, those skills that I know she has shared with other boards and other boards in the city have benefited from and um, will only serve to strengthen the um, Hunt Board of Trustees in that way also. Thank you. So I would hope everyone will support her nomination. Thank you. Anyone and appointment. else? Well, I, too, would like to thank you for being willing to volunteer again to your beloved city and uh, welcome back Thank you. to the Colp. Yes. <laughs> and we will take up your nomination later on in the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you to everyone. <clears throat> so then <clears throat> we have... Um, some nominations for the Tax Increment Financing Advisory Board. <clears throat> so, Mayor, would you like to introduce, um, I see that two were unable to come, so they'll be at the next meeting. Could you introduce the two out of the other four that should be here? Yes, of Please. course, Madam Chair. Thank so you. to my to my immediate right is uh, Arthur Spelios, and uh, uh, to his right is Eric Druhart, both who I've nominated to the uh, TIF Advisory Board. Now, okay. as you know, um, <coughs> the Board of Aldermen recently passed a tax increment financing district, which encompasses um, properties on both the north and and areas on both the north and south of the river. And the purpose of that is to use any taxes generated by new development in that uh, district uh, to making improvements in the district, principally along the river and elsewhere where they might be appropriate. Uh, the Board of Aldermen has to appropriate uh, any funds or approve any expenditures, but uh, the advisory board uh, needs to, it's their their job to advise the city on where they think the money could best be spent. Now the tax increment financing district was adopted pursuant to state law and the advisory board is another uh, requirement uh, of, the, of the tax increment financing district that is set forth in state law. And so we focused as the law requires on, on people who either live in the district or own property in the district or own property very abutting the district. 
And um, two of those nominees come before you tonight. So um, Mr. Spelios owns Crown Linen, uh, which is, uh, and, and the Technology Park. Uh, he moved his business here after building it down in Massachusetts. Uh, he's one of the great examples of people who have moved businesses uh, from Massachusetts up here to Nashua and has operated here, I think, since 1988 uh, and, in, and in their current location, I believe, since 1992. Um, not only does the business employ a lot of people and the technology park has uh, been a great addition to the city, but um, um, Mr. Spileos has been a great cooperator with all of the city's initiatives uh, pertaining to the, to the river and the like. Uh, very generously, he allowed uh, public access to a boat ramp that is um, uh, on his property uh, right next to the technology park so that uh, people can go, get, go down there and gain access to the, to the uh, National River. And that is really the only boat ramp between the, the Mine Falls Dam and the, uh, the Jackson Falls Dam where people can uh, put boats in the water. So that was uh, extremely helpful and generous uh, um, uh, act of uh, public good. And um, I know Arthur will do a great job in, um, in helping to advise us regarding the, uh, the, the district, and uh, I am glad to be able to nominate him. Uh, Mr. Druart is a, a resident of Jackson Falls Condominiums. Really, because I see him, whenever I see him, he's asking me about like the riverfront and you know, should this be maintained better and all that. So he's always right, you know, better job should have been done. and. Uh, so he's very interested in the riverfront. His wife used to own a business downtown. Um, he teaches at Assumption College. Uh, he had a successful business career before that. Uh, and uh, as a, you know, obviously is along the river every day um, because of where he lives. <coughs> and uh, I know that uh, he also will do a great job and, uh, and is very committed to uh, Nashua's riverfront and the district that's comprised or, or encompassed by the, uh, by the tax uh, increment financing district. Thank you. So maybe I'll ask Arthur and then Eric to just say a few words about uh, their background or anything they wish to say. And uh, uh, you can then, of course, ask them any questions that you wish. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm honored that the uh, mayor would ask me to be on the committee. This would be the, a first for me. I'm in the commercial laundry business. So uh, TIF committees, I have a lot to uh, learn. Hopefully, I can make a contribution. Uh, my family, we own the uh, Milliard uh, Technology Park, and uh, we take great pride in keeping the property up and uh, and we're delighted that the citizens in uh, Nashua can use the uh, parking lot and launch their boats. So prior to uh, maybe last year, we had a system where everybody would have to come and get a sign of release. And when the mayor approached me, uh, something I never even gave it a thought, that it was very inconvenient because people on a Friday evening or a Saturday would decide they want to go kayaking and uh, our office wasn't open. So we were able to uh, uh, craft a nice agreement with the city, and we're delighted. Everything's been working out just fine. And uh, I'll try to make a contribution. I don't know uh, if it uh, parallels my skill set, but I'll do the best I can to try to uh, give you uh, at least a property owner's uh, point of view on uh, what would be best for everybody. So. Thank you for your uh, your time and uh, your confidence. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Mayor. Thank you, also, Mr. Mayor. I, I didn't know I was a thorn in your side. Uh, I didn't. I didn't <laughs> say that. I said no a very constructive, uh, very constructive <laughs> participant. No, no. But since I live at uh, 52 Main Street, which is the Jackson Fall uh, condominiums. And also, given that my wife had a uh, flower shop, Ikebana Flower, next to Martha's Exchange, uh, with, with, we're, we were very concerned about the river's edge. And uh, uh, I'm from France originally, but I, I've lived in, in Nashua since uh, early, 
late late 1999, uh, we moved to uh, Jackson Falls. Uh, we were maybe the, the second owners uh, there, uh, but we're we're very uh, committed to seeing the beautification of, of, of the river, uh, both sides, including the one uh, across the way near the library, which needs a he uh, some help. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but anyway, uh, I teach at Assumption College, so uh, I have quite a commute <laughs> every day. But uh, uh, this is a second career for me. I, I was working for Bristol Myers Squibb and General Foods before. And uh, so I see it as a, as a way to give back to, to Nashua. And, and again, I don't know if I have the, the skill set. Uh, my specialty is international business. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I can promise that I will uh, lean on my wife for help with the vegetation. And the <laughs> uh, but uh, that's, that's really because I'm, a, I'm an owner. Uh, and, and the river is beautiful and, and needs beautification. And so if the TIF uh, Development District can, can help in uh, successfully doing that, I'm all for it. So thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Do I have any questions? Alden Lusha. Thank you both. Thank you for volunteering to you know be part of the TIF um, District. It's hard to find good people, and you both sound like Terrific people. I know Arthur. Uh, you know we were neighbors back many many years ago. It sounds like you're you were a good neighbor then, and you're still a good neighbor because you're allowing the city to use some of your property for for launching boats, and and that's hard, very neighborly. It's hard to believe it was uh, almost thirty years. Thirty. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Time sure does fly. But I welcome you. I think you'll be a great uh, great person to have, and and you, Eric, as well. I think your Thank background you. lends itself to. Maybe a different skill set that that we don't have that that you can bring to the table. So thank you both for thank you stepping forward. Thanks, Anyone? Alderman Lopez. I have two questions, and they're both fully loaded, so I just want to do them one at a time. Um, one of them is um, in the recent conversations about the Mohawk Cannery, TIF has been raised several times as a possible vehicle for helping to support a city contribution. How do you see the TIF? Is it mostly? Would your priorities be more cosmetic or social amenities, or do you see? value in infrastructure, that kind of stuff, environmental? Either one of you can answer. Uh, <clears throat> uh, quite. I think, uh, I, I'm not familiar, first of all, with the whole Mohawk tannery, but uh, if it, is it a property that? It is not yet a TIF district, um, okay. and it's, but it is on the river. It's around the bend from where um, your business is, I believe. Um, and I believe it's upriver from where you live. Um, Mohawk Tannery is an abandoned business site. Um, they dump toxins into some lagoons. Uh, the EPA and the developer are looking at developing the site. The neighbors would prefer full removal. The EPA is looking for encapsulation. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the city can't afford to just, you know, blank check it into cleanliness. Mm -hmm. So TIF might be a potential element of that in the future. I think this could possibly be a... a the first <laughs> issue to consider. I don't know who sets up And, and actually, I guess this question is for the mayor, is do they have any input as to the viability of a TIF, or is it more after TIF funds have been identified and, and an area created, then they just advise based on what they have? So this tax increment financing is right along the river near the Main Street Bridge, and it's defined by the legislation. Mm -hmm. Of course, Mohawk is further to the west upriver, and if there were a TIF there, it would be a separate, totally separate. So it wouldn't separate. be under this TIF advisory board? No, no, no. Okay, sorry, guys. I guess my question is uh, irrelevant. <laughs> so each each uh, tax incre increment financing district has to have its own advisory board. So were there a Mohawk Tannery tax increment financing district, we would need to have a separate board for that particular region. Um, so I think... Uh, uh, again, a separate question, and um, uh, the this advisory board will simply be focused on the downtown tax or increment financing district and advising us what improvements we can make there, and would really not be involved in the Mohawk Tannery issue, really, you know, whatsoever. Count yourself lucky. Um, so my second question is um, with regards to the library walk, which was referenced earlier. 
Um, there's considerable concern about people that are living on the trail, people who might be in the library area. Um, and there seem to be two schools of thoughts, either trim the bushes back and put lights in and maybe uh, not allow loitering on a, a scenic trail, or support the programs that are doing outreach and trying to intervene and kind of treating the problem at the source. What are your opinions and experiences in working with those kind of situations? I, I can certainly uh, support uh, trying to solve that, that issue because uh, I walk my dog uh, and I go, you know, behind margaritas and I take the pedestrian bridge and come back behind the library and I can find every morning three, four, five people that uh, have spent the night uh, when it's not raining. Um, signs that uh, say now no loitering uh, have been put up. I don't know, probably by the, by the city. Um, we face the river, so we see sometimes uh, police uh, officers that are trying to uh, manage them. and m maybe move them. I don't know. I don't know if they can. I don't know if. Um, but it, this is certainly a, a problem. And I think, like you're saying, if there was <coughs> a walking uh, of the vegetation on that path and maybe better lighting, then uh, it would be a, a, an area that would be too visible for homeless people uh, to stay, to loiter in. There, there are, it's full of uh, uh, beer cans and so on. So it's probably a good time to plug a, our big cleanup nice on sword. Saturday for that. Um, so Great American Downtown is organizing a cleanup this Saturday. Um, but what were your, what are your thoughts? My thoughts? Well, I'll be frank with you. We have 65 businesses in our building and a lot of people work there. And two or three times during the year, um, I have to call the police and ask them to come up and remove some of the, um, I guess you'd call them homeless camps up on the top of a ridge line that everybody can see what's going on. And, uh, you know, they're going to the bathroom, which is quite natural, and I can't allow something like that. We've had... Um, a few situations every year or so, we have to be diligent about uh, not having these people around because our tenants and the employees are nervous about it. Now, just, a, uh, just about a month and a half ago, we had <clears throat> someone was able to get into our building through the security code. We have it all on camera. It just totally took all the fire extinguishers and did terrible damage in that cafeteria, tore a lot of lights out, just pure vandalism. It was, um, I don't know if you'd classify him as a homeless person, but the cameras, they were camped out by the gazebo. So I don't know what the answer is. I can tell you, I'll be very frank with you, I don't want them on our property. So I don't know what, the, uh, what you can do with them. So would you extend that philosophy to the TIF district? To the what district? The area that this advisory board would look over. I the don't even. Spaces. I don't even. I'm not familiar with the district, but if I wouldn't. I, I. I wouldn't wish anybody to do anything that I wouldn't want on my own property. I guess is the best way I would answer that. I mean, if I don't want that situation on my property, I mean, why would I want it for anybody else's property? It's inconsistent. Well, answers my question. Okay. Anyone else? Alderman Gidge, did you have your hand up? Yes, Mr. Spillers. Yes. Uh, congratulations. You were certainly worked hard uh, with your business. It is uh, very successful. You have worked hard, and the technology park is long haul to to get it the way it is right now. Congratulations on that, and definitely for letting people go down there and put their, their boats in and uh, take the time. This is really, really important. Uh, you truly are 
Uh, I don't know where the mayor finds people like this who, who wishes to contribute some of the time, but so much thank you. Now, this gentleman, the thorn, I read his biography and... He's uh, not a thorn. He's yeah, like oh, a oh, gentle... <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> like a gentle no, prodder. You know? but to, to be honest, every what? time, like the mayor said, uh, every time I saw him, I was cornering him and, and talking about the river's edge. <laughs> well, you know, you know, Mr. Mayor, I think you should be very careful because it says he practices Japanese uh, fencing. I'm not sure exactly what that is. It's a... It's a uh, Two hands uh, fencing. It's not the European fencing, but it's a two handed sword fighting. It's not a real sword, it's a bamboo sword. Should I call <laughs> your master? And... No, I'm just a black belt. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much. Yeah. I... Anyone else? We'd like to thank you two gentlemen for offering to sit on this advisory board. We'll bring your nominations up later on in the meeting for your confirmation. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Okay. Okay, communications. We have a communication from Larry Budrow, Human, Service, Human Resources Director, relative to proposed amendment to Resolution 18066, unaffiliated employee sick leave. Okay. And we have another one. Oh, yeah. Make a motion. Do you accept the communications from Mr. Boudreaux? There being none, no objections, I accept the communication and we'll place it on file. We have, uh, can I make a motion? Yeah. I make a motion to suspend the rules to allow for the introduction of a communication received after the agenda was prepared. Yes. Any objection? Okay. Would you like to read it? Take a yes or no vote. Yeah. Yay. All yeah. those in favor? Yay. Thank you. I have a communication to June Karen from Tim Cummings, Director of Economic Development, uh, dated today regarding communication opposing ordinance 18025 relative to amending vendor license ordinances. My motion was to accept and place on file. Okay. There being no objections, we'll take the communication and place it on file. <laughs> That's what I was laughing at. Okay. Application to license hawkers, peddlers, vendors license. None. Okay, appointments by the mayor. Alderman Wilshire. Thank you. I move to recommend the confirmation <coughs> of the following appointments by the mayor. Terry Romano to the Hunt Memorial Building Board of Trustees for a term to expire September 30th, 2023. Are we gonna She's not here. Right. Um, Skip her. Okay. And the, to the Tax Increment Financing Advisory Board, Eric Drewert, Arthur Spilios, Director Cummings, Director Marchant, and Treasurer. Tax Collector Dave Fredette for terms to expire September 30th, 2019. Are there any comments concerning the motion? Um, I would just like to comment that my questions were specifically in regard to how this uh, city prioritizes spending its money, where its values are, what's important. Um, and I think it's important to remember that people who are without a home but living in Nashua do have investment in the properties, the public spaces that they have. Um, and I am not supportive of any measures to remove their access to that. That being said, that area, they're living there because they don't have somewhere else to go. So I favor the approach of supporting programs that are trying to find them places to go, calling outreach programs like Greater National Mental Health, like City Welfare, like Harbor Homes, to help them find a solution rather than you know, calling the police because they're doing human needs where they shouldn't be doing them because they have nowhere else to do them. So my position is, with regards to that, not really a mystery. But at the same time, I think that's probably a bigger issue than the TIF District Financing Advisory Board is going to tackle. I was just more interested in what kind of priorities they would choose to spend money on. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Okay, no, no objections. Um, the motion is before you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carried. And um, all of these people will be um, brought forth before the Board of Aldermen in two weeks. Thank you. Okay. Next motion, Alderman Wilson. Motion. motion to table the appointments of Rob Carroll and Michael Serrato to the Tax Increment Financing Advisory Board until the next Personnel Administrative Affairs Committee meeting. Okay. Any comments concerning the motion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Appointments by the President of the Board of Aldermen. I will make a motion to recommend the confirmation of John C. Franzini and John McAllister to the Auditorium Commission for terms to expire December 31st, 2020. Okay. Any comments concerning this motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Unfinished business. We have none. New business resolution. Resolution 18073, proposing an amendment to the city charter relative to filling vacancies on the elected boards by majority vote of the remaining members of that board. I will make a motion to recommend final passage of our 18073. Okay. Do we have any comments concerning this legislation? Alderman Lopez. I think it's one of the easiest things we can do to save money because Life happens and situations happen where people are not able to finish their term. And holding special ele uh, elections is certainly a burden on our um, administrative staff, our city clerks, our volunteers who are showing up to run the polls. Um, and I think it also, it wears the public down and you see very poor turnout at these um, events. So it, it seems logical to me that the people serving on a board should have the say over who's going to fill out a temporary position because they're the ones most in touch with the problem and the issues. Thank you. Anyone else? Now you understand what this legislation does. Okay. Ald uh, Alderman? That's right. Mm -hmm. um, if it's the one that I believe this is, and I think it is, and let's put it that way, um, that means that if we allow that board to choose that person, we no longer give the city of Nashua, the citizens, the opportunity to vote their choice, correct? Right. What, it, what it does, and correct me currently, if I'm right, wrong. Well, let me, maybe if I phrase it another way, currently today, if someone loses, leave their position, we go through an election all over again, correct? Right. Which Nashua has the right to vote. When I look at this, I look at this as you're taking that right away. I know you're taking away because of finances. I'm not sure that even this way is the best way to go, but I think that would be a concern to quite a few residents here in Nashua. So i just I'll like the comments to be you know, out there. That's fine. That that is a concern. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alderman Wilshire, maybe Can you could. ask the city clerk to join us for this? Because my motion should be amended to say to recommend that resolution 18073 is necessary because what this does is this puts this before the voters. Right. Okay. Trish, okay. could you give us a little bit of information on how this will work? For, um, for the record, my name is uh, Patricia Pietzo, and I'm city clerk, so thank you, uh, Honorable Chair and members of the committee. So what this is doing is back in November of 2015, excuse me, 2005, November 8, 2005, there was a charter question before the voters of the city of Nashua relative to this change. So this change was then at that point passed by the voters of a vote of 5787 to 3088 that this will now change it. Prior to 2006, when this went to effect, January 1, 2006, this is how a board, if a vacancy occurred on any board, this is exactly how it was always filled. I know back 
in um, 2004 and 2005, this did go through um, the committee and personnel. It went through the board and everything where changes were made to the revisions which you see today. So if it's more than six months in a day prior to election, a special election is held by the board to determine the date. But if it's within six months in a day, the special election is still held. It would it, no, take it back. The set, if it's less than six months in a day at the election in November, the highest vote getter at that point in time who is not already an existing member of the board would then take over for that term to the end of the end of the year, basically, or to when it expires the end of the year, if it's less than six months in a day, over six months in a day. But there was a lot of talk back and forth back in 2004 and 2005 regarding this same subject. Did so, you? go ahead, yes. Alderman. Yep. So the next question is, you said this is something that's going to come before the voters? Okay. Yeah, if I may. So what will happen is if the board deems this necessary, um, this will go back to the full board to deem it necessary. From there, it will have to have a public hearing. Um, and I will also have to submit the documentation to the DRA, the Secretary of State and the Attorney General's office to make sure it doesn't conflict with any type of state statutes or anything. Once they get the report back, then it would go on the November 2019 ballot. It has to go on a municipal election. Thank you. I know this happened to me <laughs> many years ago. Um, there was an alderman at large that left the board. Then the Ward 7 alderman was put in the alderman at large seat, so that left Ward 7 open. And there were two candidates, myself and Paul Chassie at the time, and the Board of Aldermen took a vote. And that's how Paul Chassie got on the board. So, but yeah, that's how we used to do it, and it made a whole lot of sense, you know, not to have these special elections and low turnout, and I think it makes sense. I like this idea better. Alderman Kelly. Thank you, Ms. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Chair. I'm sorry. It's been a long day. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about the last election and the last special election that we had, what the turnout was and what the cost to the city was. If you don't have it right in front of you, you don't, I'm not putting on the I spot, made but. sure I prepared for this evening, and <laughs> I, um, including the other special elections that we've had since this charter, since this charter amendment passed back in 2000. It came into effect really January 1, 2006. So since then, we've had one, two, three. We've had six special elections. So the March 20th election, which cost us a 30, about $30,000, their turnout was 3.37%. That is the lowest turnout. The other turnout that was even with a state election, when we ran it with a state election, um, if I look at the November 6, 2007 election for vacancy in the Board of Public Works, this total turnout was 31.6, but for the special election, only 22% of the voters took ballots for that election. Um, the election in 2015 for the Board of Aldermen at Large, which was not tied into another election again, was 8.11%. Due to the fact that all our polling locations are in schools, we hire the police officers, whether school is in session or not, it's just the safety concern there. And a matter of fact, I just got the bill for that uh, for the state primary election, and it was $9,300 alone, never mind what you have to pay for all your election officials as well. Alderman Kelly. Thank you. Uh, just a follow-up, you said that there was one where you tacked it on to a state election? That is correct. There was a couple that we tacked on to a state election. So November 6, 2007 was tied into a municipal election. Mm -hmm. Um, September 9, 2008 was a state primary election, and that was a vacancy on the Board of Education, which we in turn also had a special election, municipal election, but we had to maintain two separate checklets at that election due to the fact it was a party primary, yeah. which on uh, a party primary, you have to choose the party in order to get a ballot, but if they didn't want to vote in that, but just wanted to vote in the special they were able to do so. So we had to maintain two separate checklists. Uh, November 8, 2011, again, it was tied in with the municipal election. 
And then we also, September 8, 2015, tied in with our mayoral primary a vacancy for the Board of Public Works as well. So do you find when you tie it in that it's, it's just as complicated for your staff or more? It's just as complicated. Okay. Alderman Lopez, please. Um, I just had a question about security, but I guess you already answered it with the number of police. Um, if we had these special elections, we'd be required to have police. Um, would we necessarily be required to close the school down? We normally will not close the school. Um, since I've been here for the past 10 years, this is the first time for a party primary, a state pri uh, primary that we've had school closed. Mm -hmm. Um, normally, the November 1's uh, elections, they do close the schools. They have, I shouldn't say they close, it's a teacher workshop day. Mm -hmm. So the teachers will be in some of the schools. Um, the only time that we did request um, the schools to be closed is, again, when a presidential primary is announced. We never know when that's going to be announced. Um, and the last time we had our presidential primary in 2016, they called a snow day. So that the, and gave parents advance time so that we could close the schools. <clears throat> Alderman Melissa Gola. Yeah, I just Thank a you. comment. I believe um, this November we will be having a special election also because there's a vacancy on the board of fire commissioners. So um, there will be two ballots, and I think that's what people don't understand that you actually get two ballots. It's not just one ballot with the special election tacked on. That is correct. There will be two separate ballots, um, and uh, we are working on local controls in there because some people may not want a city ballot, some people want to be, won't want a state ballot, and we're running two checklists. But that will be tied into that. As a matter of fact, the filing period, we are currently in the middle of the filing period, which will expire this Friday. Okay. Anyone else? Alderman Keller. Thank you. You're I just wanted to clarify how long someone would, and maybe you have this answer, but I can't remember, um, how long someone would be in an interim appointed, like the longest they could be in an interim appointed position. I'm not Nothing. sure for, for, you mean for a vacancy on a, a board? Yeah. It, it depends. It depends when the vacancy occurs and when the aldermen call for the election, when we tie the election in. <coughs> So if it's a four-year term and there's three years left, would it go the full four-year term? Or no, the, special, the, oh, the vacancy has to be filled within 180 days. I think, right. it, I think it is. So right. the, the special election has to be called within 180 days. Okay. So, so what when I'm you asking do, is if, if it's a four-year term and there's three years left, the person would fit fill the rest of that term, or would there be an election on the two-year mark? No, they would no. fill the unexpired term. Okay. And that's how this one is appearing on the ballot. It's always filling the unexpired term. Okay. Oh, okay. Anyone else? No. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So you heard the motion. <clears throat> All those in favor of to recommend that R18073 is necessary. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion passes. Thank you. Okay, new business ordinances. We have ordinance 18023, changing the managing department and ordinances regarding parking. I will move for final passage of uh, ordinance 18023. Okay. You heard the motion. Is there oh, Alderman Lopez? I mean, there's confusion on my part. Didn't we change the managing from police to um, economic development? Are we leaving it that way, or what's going on? I don't know if I brought that. Do you have it, Alderman Lopez? Yes. Um, it's changing it from the transportation department manager to the parking department manager. Uh, so it's actually just continuing the same trend. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Next ordinance. We have ordinance 
25, amending vendor license ordinances. I will make a motion to recommend final passage. Okay. And um, Ms. Piazzu, you are here to uh, speak on this, if you would come forward. <clears throat> And you heard the communication from Director Cummings? Okay. okay. Good evening, Madam Chair and honorable members of the committee. For the record, my name is Patricia Pietzu, and I am the city clerk. Um, I, Economic Director uh, Tim Cummings did send a communication at this point in time opposing the language as written and uh, with a broad scope, and I, we do agree, I do agree with them, and I know there's also concerns on um, a couple of the departments I spoke with as far as fire, police, and health. Um, I don't think this is what um, the intent of the legislation was. My understanding that originally that we were looking at bringing in a legislation to affirm farmer's market. The way that this language states now puts it in part of the vendor licensing. But it also doesn't address the sub-license fees where we can continue to charge $5 per vendor and whether or not that vendor can now still continue to charge $150 for their sublicense fee to participate in it. I would like to see this tabled at this time just so that more discussions can be um, done and more um, logistics looked into um, to define this further down at this point in time. I'll withdraw my motion to recommend final passage and my new motion will be to table. Non-debatable. Okay, motion before you is to uh, table 01825. Any questions? Is, is it non-debatable? Oh, non-debatable. Right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Okay. All right, motion passes. All right, so that is tabled until we get further information on what is going on. And Madam Chair, if I may, I will definitely work with uh, Mr. Cummings and bring a few of the people to the table with the Special Events Committee along with, along with Alderman Tom Lopez um, so that we can make sure that we come, can come forth with what we are looking to really do with this ordinance. Moving forward. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. <coughs> okay. All right. Tabled in committee. I'll make a motion to Take from the table resolution 18066. Okay. Motion is to take from the table R 18 066. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And I will make a motion on resolution 18066 for final passage as amended. Okay. So, uh, the mayor would like to speak, and Mr. Boudreaux from HR, would you please come forward as well? Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Mayor, we'll let you speak first. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm here to uh, indicate that I cannot support the resolution, especially that as amended. Uh, and the reason that that is the case, and I can explain it, and I'm going to differ with my friends from the police department who are also here on this, on this one subject. Um, the reason for my thinking on this is that we are essentially giving $179,000 and actually probably more to a group of employees who are not entitled to this money at the present time. Uh, dollars are short. I think we have a responsibility to the residents and the taxpayers to uh, con to exercise fiscal restraint and to uh, make sure that we preserve the funds that we have and not give money away that we really don't have to. Now, the way that this arose is that uh, in 2001, 
the benefit structure was changed pursuant to a budget passed by the Board of Aldermen at that time. And at that point, uh, prior to that point, employees were entitled to accrue up to 720 hours or 90 days of sick time and be paid out upon retirement for that amount of uh, a, a vacation, a, a sick time for that amount of sick time. And in 2001, this is 17 years ago, the city changed the benefit, the Board of Aldermen through the budget, and it's been subsequently <laughs> reenacted a number of times, changed the benefit to say that rather than uh, full accrual up to 720 hours and a full payout, that as of July 1 of 2001, again, 17 years ago, the benefits were changed to be a 20% of the sick time with no maximum. And uh, it was thought at the time that this would help save the city money, would reduce uh, retirement payouts for the city, and that system has been in effect for the last 17 years and the people that might benefit from this have been working under that system now for 17 years. Now the argument has been made that <clears throat> people who were hired before that date, and there are a group of about 12, um, who were in the merit system and who had begun to work when the employee could accrue 720 hours, uh, should uh, uh, that, that they should be now retroactively granted the benefit that was changed uh, uh, 17 years ago because they may have worked for a few years or even a week. And there's, uh, it could be a very short period of time under the old system that they should be entitled to all of the money that they would have accrued if the benefits hadn't been changed. But, but they were. Um, so we have, we have a number of employees who um, would be granted this extra $179,000, but in addition to them, there are about five or six employees who were working at the time who have since retired. They did not get this because they were not entitled to this expanded benefit. So if we were to grant, go back and retroactively 17 years later, change benefits and give people $179,000, what about the people who've retired? Why wouldn't they get it too? Because they were there possibly longer than some of the people who would uh, now be gaining this windfall. That would be another $79,000. So we're talking about $250,000 of taxpayers' money, which would be paid out uh, to people who would not be entitled to it. Now, I'm not saying that we don't have a group of hardworking, dedicated employees who've worked these years. But again, this happened 17 years ago. I mean, there's a, isn't there a statute of limitations on something? So. We have talked, you and I, Madam Chair, in detail about this, about what would be fair under the circumstances. And what we came up with is what was originally proposed. And what is proposed is that for the employees that are uh, at issue, they would be granted 100% of the sick time and, and the sick pay, time payout that they had earned as of July 1, 2001, when the benefits were changed. So that if an employee started in 1998, had worked three years under the old system and had earned 100 hours, under the proposal, the compromise proposal, they would be entitled to those 100 hours and then for the period of time after the benefits were changed, were changed, they would be entitled to the 20 percent. So they would be give, they would be granted everything that they had earned as of the day that the uh, that the retirement that the, the benefit was changed, and then from the day the benefit was changed, they would additionally get the 20 percent. 
And we thought that was fair because the city, like any employer, can change benefits at any time. I mean, uh, we changed health benefits, for example, a few years ago. Are we going to 17 years from now, someone come back and say, oh, you shouldn't have done that, that wasn't fair, and therefore you're going to have to pay back, you know, thousands of employees what they would have, the benefit they would have had if you hadn't changed the, the benefits? Um, so I think we arrived, Madam Chair, at a fair compromise. No one would have lost anything. And we would recognize the city's right to change benefits when, when the city, uh, in its discretion, and in that case it was the Board of Aldermen 17 years ago, decided to make the change. Now the problem with letting um, someone make the, now the amendment that's proposed would, someone, would, would allow someone to make the election, but of course, that just, it's just the same as granting them retroactively $250,000 worth of benefits uh, you know, 17 years later because, of course, everyone's going to adopt and elect the, the alternative, that, the old alternative, which would give, gain them more money. Um, another point on this is that when you look at uh, the specifics for some of the employees, as of the date the benefits were changed, for some people, and if we, I suppose, were in executive session, maybe we could get into the details of this, but for some, you know, they had like 16 hours accumulated. That's it, something like that. So because they had gotten, they'd earned 16 hours now for 17 years, they're gonna get this expanded benefit, even though that was changed 17 years ago. So I don't think it's fair to the taxpayers. I don't think it is the right thing to do. I think the compromise is, gives every employee uh, everything that they earned as of the date of the, um, as of the change, and then gives them the benefit of the change as well. And uh, that's why, as we discuss the merits and, and uh, uh, pros and cons of this, uh, we looked at this compromise proposal that would grant 100% um, of the time up to the date when the benefit was changed, but then you know, recognized that the city 17 years ago did make the change, and uh, uh, that's the way it is. Um, those are my thoughts, and of course, um, I'm sure that there are some people who disagree. There's particularly an employee in the police department who feels strongly about this, a civilian employee. Uh, but uh, if you have questions for me, I would be glad to um, to answer them. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bedrug, would you like to um, talk about what these changes were that was that's in this letter? Because I was a little confused on on this. So thank you. And then I'm we'll take questions group. from the group. Thank you. Bodro, the Human Resources Director. This is the third time that I've been in a discussion about this, and the, the second, the first time was uh, several months ago when we were discussing some of the uh, follow-up to the passage of the revised unaffiliated employees plan. I think that was at the June 4th meeting. Right. At the September meeting of this group, the ordinance that Mayor Donches has just spoken of um, was discussed, and there was quite a bit of testimony about that. And the sentiment from the police commission it was essentially that the employees hired between 1995 and 2001 should not be grandfathered. That the grandfathering that the change should have been made effective on July 1st, 2001 rather than 1995, since that's when the activity took place. Uh, City Engineer Stephen Dukran testified at that session, and he, was, he is one of the people who would be impacted by this change in the legislation, and he asked the committee not to do that, because he would prefer to maintain his sick leave rather than have only a maximum accrual of 720 hours. So subsequent to that meeting, I was requested by the chair, Alderman Karen, uh, to work with the legal department and draft a proposed amendment to the 
resolution that's before the group, and that's that's what I did, and that's what the group has before. It provides people hired between 1995 and 2001 a choice, so that if the amendment is basically changed, not to do as Mayor Donches prefers, but to give those people <coughs> the 720 hours and receive 100% upon retirement, they could choose to do that, or they could choose to leave themselves in the position they're in, which is to have an unlimited accrual and receive 20% upon of that upon retirement. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I will uh, open up for questions because I've got swing this in my head because I'm a little confused about that. Um, Alderman Wilshire. Thank you. Granted, 17 years ago, I get it. But I, I, my question is to you, uh, Mayor Donches, about other city employees who may have been affected by this that didn't include those 12. Yeah. And they were, were they made whole? Were they, did they get this back? Well, they did not. So, um, we're talking about employees who began working between 1995 and 2001 um, who are in the merit system. Six, I, either five or six of those people who would have been in the same group if they were still working have since retired. So the point I was making is that, um, okay, so someone who, let's say, compare someone who worked a year under the old system, say, from 2000 to 2001, and now is being retroactively granted a very, very lucrative benefit, what about the person who worked five years under the old system, was then changed, and then worked another 10 or 12 years, but has since retired? That person would get nothing? even though they worked longer under the old system? I mean, is that, quote, fair, unquote? So even though they worked five or six times as long under the old system, they would get nothing, but someone who had worked only a short time under the old system would, would gain a windfall? To me, that is not fair, and I think you could see them coming before you and say, well, wait, I was there then, and uh, I didn't get this. And I think you, you know, you're going to be faced, you would be faced uh, potentially with um, that fairness argument. That's what I'm talking about. Are there other employees in the fire department that got this benefit back? Um, I don't know, but uh, the, the I, mean, I don't. I'm not sure. We could check that out. Yes, I believe they were. I believe they were. Are you aware, of Mr. Boudreau? In the new unaffiliated policy, there was a change made to include language that allows all fire department employees, there are six that are unaffiliated, to accrue a maximum of 720 hours and receive 100% payout. It had not, it, no one had retired who had joined the organization after 1995, so it had not impacted anybody yet. They were, they were, they were, all, everyone who's retired from the fire department so far received the full 720 because they were here before 1995. We have the minutes of the meeting of the personnel advisory board who are volunteers that are appointed by the mayor and confirmed by this board. The conclusion of their um, discussion on this says the Personnel Advisory Board unanimously recommends that 18066 be amended in its entirety and place, replaced with the language that was provided by Commissioner Tolner. So just wanted to throw that out there. It's a recommendation of the Personnel Advisory Board. Okay. Um, okay. Um, before I ask the questions from you, Alderman Lopez, uh, um, the chairman of the police commission is here. Would you like to speak? You only have two minutes. <laughs> Not a week? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
I'll be of uh, Commissioner Toner. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll be brief since we already were here a couple of times previously speaking about this. Uh, the bottom line really is fairness. No matter how you look at it, you turn it sideways, upside down, in and out. So every, what we're looking for is, is fairness. It is a difficult position that we're all in to make a decision like this. The change in 1995, uh, retro retroactive to 1995 that was made in 2001, this change was affected employees that were already employed by the city of Nashua. So they took the job, understanding that these were the benefits. And then six years later, the benefits were changed. The mayor's right, it has been 17 years since this was uh, changed. But during that time, uh, my previous predecessors, Mo Rell, had sent a letter to the mayor's office. Um, I guess uh, Mayor Schreeder was in office then, so you can count how many years ago that was, to ask for this change retroactive. And they did not get a response. Another communication was sent, and they did not get a response. So as from the perspective of the police commission, you know, it hasn't been 17 years that we've been asking for this to be changed. Uh, that request was done a number of years ago. Um, I've been told that the total payout is somewhere around $172,000, but I think we were told at the last committee meeting but that that would be spread out over, you know, eight to ten years. Um, as far as someone who is already working for the city and already retired, it's my understanding that retirement benefits, you know, you cannot change them retroactively. So, um, but I think the, uh, the compromise that is being discussed, that proposal doesn't do a thing for the employee of the police department because that employee was given a letter by um, Chief Gross back then that more or less indemnified her on those sick days at that time. So while it may be good for other employees, she already has that in her file. Um, so what we're just asking for again, you know, every time we come before the committee or we went to the personnel board, um, the discussions that we had with them was exactly the same as the discussions that we've had with this committee twice now. Um, and both those participants, um, I would say enthusiastically agreed you know, with the legislation and the change. I don't think um, other people were there. I'm not misrepresenting them. The comments coming out of that committee were, I don't know how any employer could do that. So um, again, I said I'd be brief. I probably went along a little, a little longer than I thought, but basically the bottom line is um, it's a matter of fairness and we asked the committee uh, to do the right thing. I understand the mayor's concerns that he's mentioned. Um, I had an opportunity to speak to him on this too. So I appreciate the time that you gave me as well as what the mayor gave us. Thank you. Okay. Alderman Lopez, you had your hand up. Um, yeah, I just, I, I see the purpose of this as recognizing people who are currently working for us as and what they bring to the table and acknowledging the merits of our, our employees so that we offer them something to continue working for us. I don't want to lose good you know, staff members with a lot of experience just because we're no longer compensating them in the same way or because we did them some injustice in the past on a previous incarnation of the board. Um, I am sensitive to what the mayor is saying that there could be people who have already retired who will next come. But I feel like that's always going to be the case. There's always going to be a next question to have. Um, it's been referenced by several people here that they've come here before this committee three times. Well, we're going to be meeting to do this stuff like this continuing anyway. Like, we have to have business in front of us. We have to make decisions on it. I think this one, the mayor, I appreciate his position for fiscal responsibility because you know he shouldn't, as a mayor, be in favor of overspending at any point. Um, but I think as a board, we should be recognizing our responsibilities here. Um, I do want to know if um, this language makes it clear that the accrual of hours is for the hours accrued before 1991, or if it is for providing that benefit scheme for the entirety of their service. Um, so I guess that's direct, That's for Director Boudreau. Yeah. You may speak. Yeah, this, this accounts for accruing through the duration of their service. So I guess another point of compromise, if we're interested in it, is to narrow down the choices to would you like to have accrued everything you accrued in 1991 and then switch it over. Um, I think one of the strengths of offering them the choice was that 
Some of them may choose the continuing benefit system and then they did it willingly versus some who choose the old one. And I, I can pretty much guarantee that if it's, do you want all of your hours from back then, most people are probably just going to try to take them. Mayor. All right, well, let, let me just make it clear what's happening. So um, what was done in 2001, 2001 mm -hmm. was that um, benefits were changed. And the city or any employer has the absolute right to change benefits or the way a, a retirement payout is made. And we've seen that uh, in the area of the school department, for example, there has been an effort to scale back these payouts, not to expand them. Now, I think that there was some reason for complaint by, the, by a person who had worked, say, say, three years from 1998 to 2001 under the understanding that they could accrue and be paid 100% of their sick time, of their accrued sick time. Um, and that, that, for those three years, because it was done retroactively, was taken away from them. Um, but under the compromise proposal that the committee has before it, in that example, that person who had worked three years under the old system where they could accrue 100 and be paid 100 and, and uh, um, 100 percent of their accrued sick time for that period of time that they had already worked, under the compromise proposal, they would be granted all of those sick days uh, that they had earned and had on the books as of the date the benefit was changed. So they would be paid 100% for every day that they had earned based upon the assumption that they, they could earn and be paid this sick time. Then in 2001, and that's what the compromise proposal would restore, the, the, um, the entitlement to receive the days that they had earned while they were working with the understanding that the, they could be paid for those days. But then the city changed benefits. No one had to stay working. The system was changed and the benefit changed to 20%. People kept working and now we're working with the understanding that they would get only 20%. Um, and so uh, the, and, and what this, this the, the new amendment would do would be allow them to elect to go back, back retroactively and now um, get this big get the uh, get paid for all the days they've accrued over the last 17 years, even though that's not what the benefit uh, scheme passed by the Board of Aldermen and repassed and repassed says. So I think what we arrived at, Madam Chair, is a proposal that would have paid people for everything that they had earned as of the date of the, of the change. And to suggest that it's not fair to change benefits and that people have to be retroactively paid for any benefits that were, were changed is to suggest that the city doesn't have the right to change benefit schemes. And this is not the only time this has happened. I mean, you know, numerous times has the city changed benefits and we don't go back and retroactively and there's always someone working when the benefit is changed, but we don't go back and retroactively restore uh, the, the value of the benefits that would have been earned if the, um, if the system hadn't been changed, you know, much later. Okay. Alderman Kelly. <coughs> I just ask with like a point of clarity. So. The reason that this 17 years ago was so unusual was because they actually went back five years in how they amended that, correct? So in 2001, we said if you were hired in 1995, so we actually went back in time and retroactively changed it. Is that correct? Yeah. That's the point. I was at the personal advisory board meeting that uh, Commissioner Tolder mentioned and that was the sentiment that uh, resounded with Sheila Cabot and Carol Baldwin. Um, just that they had in their, they had never in their experience uh, seen a situation grandfather. Mayor Donches is absolutely right, change things. And, and you could change this. But it was uncommon, in fact, unique in their experience. 
that it was effective six years prior. So the proposal that was originally before you would have corrected those six years, but, but recognized that the city could change benefits in 2001 and, and did so. Uh, and I'm going to speak on that because um, I was working at the time when they proposed this change. And there were a lot of us who had been working for an awful long time. And they wanted to do this for everyone, all those that were not in, the, in a union. And we fought and said that this needs to be grandfathered. And then from this point, which was 2001, this would be the 20%. So it was almost like a, a, a group of people basically got left out. In the, you know, in the, which I was unaware of. And I agree, 17 years later, but you're trying to right a wrong that should have been taken care of by the Board of Aldermen or whatever. It, you can't put blame somewhere. Um, this was brought up. We're trying to rectify it. And we have to come to some kind of, for me, some kind of compromise that will make it's not going to make everybody happy, but if we can make that and make people understand we're trying to rectify what we consider a minor wrong and move forward. And you're right, Mayor, you can make changes. <coughs> you know, the city, any employer can make any changes, but you also have to think about grandfathering those people who have been working under a, a specific um, benefit for a long time. So. Um, I have more to say, but I just wanted you to understand where that was coming from. Alderman Lopez. Uh, I just thought of a really relevant point. The mayor had referenced that previous employers, employees could potentially utilize this legislation in order to secure additional benefits. Is that actually the case, or is it a hypothetical case? And I'm asking Director Boudreaux. Is this actually written in a way that somebody who was a former employee could then accrue additional resources or a income? Farmer? You're talking about an employee now or someone who's retired is what you're referencing? I guess I guess I'm literally asking like, is this something where you might have a conflict or is it something that's hypothetical and so there isn't one? May I respond? Yes, you may. The amended resolution only addresses active employees and purposefully excludes all retired employees. My understanding is, although not secondhand, that the Corporation Council believes that's a valid exclusion. So just to clarify, there's no conflict. That's oh, what I was for looking me? For. Exactly, oh, yeah. Absolutely I was just not. To make I got sure there was what I needed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not that I believe there was, but I didn't want there to be the perception. No, so. and I would, I would okay. have recused myself. <laughs> Thank you, though. <laughs> Anyone else? Alderman Mullies ago. Oh, yes, I have not had the pleasure of being part of this for three meetings. But um, I do know that Alderman Wilshire received um, a letter from Commissioner Grant from the Fire Commission. And as I was leaving their meeting this evening, he asked me to say that he was still working to collect additional information that might be related to what you're discussing. So I'm not sure what communication has gone on between the two of you, but um, he just asked me to relay that to let you know. Well, I think the fire department is a total uh, entity because those employees that uh, the mayor was talking about earlier and Mr. Boudreaux have been rectified in the policy. That's in the new policy. Okay, that was I guess he was he he was checking to make sure everything was as it as it seems. That was my impression that it had never really been discussed with the fire commissioners, and so they were just trying to follow up to make sure. I would suggest that he contact Mr. Boudreaux and look at the yes. new policy. Okay, so anyone else? Alderman Wilshire. So just to be clear, this change that we did when we passed the merit, new merit plan included 
the rectifying of the fire department employees. Is that what you is that what you said, uh, Mr. Boudreau? Yes, there's a line added so that the fire department employees are eligible as were all night prior to 1995 merit employees eligible to accrue 720 hours and be paid 100%. Okay. Uh, may I go That's on what first? We're asking in this legislation for the other employees. So, okay. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to, when this was brought to my attention and I said that I would see what I could do, uh, the mayor and I and Alderman Wilshire met to talk about it. And one of the things that I asked the mayor and um, through H, uh, to get from HR was the names of the people that this would affect and at the point of the changeover exactly how many hours or days that particular person had. Then we met again and we felt that the compromise for us was if you had a, just to make things simple, you had a hundred hours as of July 1 of 2001, it would sit, it would sit there. You would continue to get your 20%, <clears throat> but when you retired, and let's say you had 2,000 hours, you got 20% of that, which is 400 hours, and then you would get that 100, 100 hours that was banked. You would not get more than 720 hours because nobody got more than 720 hours. And we felt that that was a compromise because we cannot, none of us here, and even as the employee, would know exactly how many days or hours you would have used in the last 17 years. There's no way, and you can't make, you can't, come up with numbers, but we felt that if this employee had this number of hours, that we could hold it and then give them that against the 20. Now, when we met last month, someone was not happy with that and they wanted something else. So we tabled this to see if we could get HR and legal to come up with something that would benefit everyone. One was to give you a choice, but once you made that choice, that was it. And now it seems like this is totally, <laughs> I guess, not what we had talked about. So for me, pick one or the other. We do this, we bank this, if you have no time, if you used all that time, whether you were there from 1985 or 1995, whatever number of years, and you have zero, day, zero hours as of 2001, you have zero, and you're going to get 20% of this total, up to 720, because I don't think anyone has retired with a large amount of hours, I would not think, but... I could be wrong, that they could get a 1,000 hours. Has anyone retired with 20%? I would not think so. No. Well, the, the, the people who have retired, were they given the same benefit, would be entitled to around seventy-five to $80,000 cash. Who, each person? No, the total group, the total group. Oh, okay. And that stretched over a long period of time because you still, you have people here that have only been here a short period of time. Maybe you have a few that might be considering retirement, but that's still not a lot of money in res um, respect to some of the other things we spend money on. It's like only half a consultant. Right. <laughs> so it's up to this committee to decide is this amendment what you want? 
do we look at this as a whole? Yes, give them a choice. I don't, whatever. I don't think they should have a choice, but that's that's my opinion, but that doesn't mean it has to go. Um, you have to agree with that. But I'm sorry, we did something that should have been taken care of a long time ago, and we didn't. So we need to step up and do something, do whatever we can, and make these employees feel that we did what we should have done 17 years ago or 18 years ago when, when it was first put into place. So now we have to decide how you want to do this. I would hope that we would try to get this resolved and get this to the board before the end of the year so that <laughs> come January, HR will know where everybody's sitting and, and go along with this. I know, Mia, this is difficult, but I think that in, in, in the final scope of things, I think you would agree that we have to do something. I don't care when <laughs> I have to do something. And you and I don't always disagree, but <laughs> this one we kind of disagree on. So, committee members, have you looked at this again? I mean, did you get your copies? Have you looked at this amendment that we had talked about and what we, because um, every time we say 100%, I look at it and go, well, it's only 100% of the balance, of whatever is there. You're not getting 720 hours, you know, if you haven't earned them. So, Alderman Wilshire. I'm going to go with uh, sticking with the Personnel Advisory Board conclusion that they unanimously recommended to go along with the um, language that was introduced in the last personnel meeting that was ultimately provided by Commissioner Tolner. I'm going to stick with that. I think the Personnel Advisory Board that was their conclusion, and I think it's my conclusion as well. Anyone else? Yep. Oh, I'm sorry, Alderman Lopez. I was trying to reread. Um, so I was just exactly wondering, has the Personal said? Advisory Board seen this edition of it? Because I think this came out of our last meeting. Hmm. Oh, has the... Have they actually seen this version? Or, I don't know. Mr. The language Wood informed this proposal, but... Can I respond to that? Is it worth having them look at it? The, the amendments in that came from Commissioner Tolner. That's what they were... That's what their conclusion was in their last meeting minutes, was that they unanimously approved. So the choice was the, their wording versus the old wording, and then letting people pick whichever they wanted. Well, so their okay. wording is in here. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, that's what, okay. So okay. Mr. Boudreaux, let me ask. Is that true, or is that they were just recommending what Commissioner Tolner had discussed with them at the meeting? Have they seen this language? Direct answer is, I'm sorry. The direct answer is they have not seen this language. But if, but I think I could help clarify if I'm... Thank you. This language is exactly what Commissioner Tolmer asked for at our first meeting and what Mayor Don just disapproves of. It then adds to it the opportunity for someone to say, no, but I don't want that. And that, that can only save the city money. So th this, I think it needs to be understood that this is the police commission recommendation that the 2001-1995, that goes away, and the people who were hired before 2001 are now considered along with the same group as all those who were hired before 1995. They're eligible to accrue a maximum of 720 hours and get paid 100% upon retirement. As a result of the last meeting, you asked that we tack onto that 
an option so that if any one of the 12, now 11 active employees didn't want to do that, they could say, I'm fine with the way it is. So the, no, the personal advisory board has not, uh, but from a logical perspective, I'm very highly sure that they would say, oh, that's fine. Somebody wants to reduce the amount of payout. That, because the effect of that would be that it would reduce the liability. If they had a choice. If they, if anybody, if they had a choice and if anybody exercised a choice. Okay. All right. And anecdotally, only one will. Right. Commissioner Tolna, would you like to speak uh, uh, to answer yeah, just Alderman Wilshire? Just to be clear, <coughs> the personal advisory board saw the first half of this. And that's what they were in agreement with wholeheartedly. The second piece came out of the last committee meeting to give somebody a choice. Right. So word for word, they've seen the first half, or first the first choice. That answers my question. Thank you. Okay. All right. So my head is still spinning here. Um, if I go to the maximum of 720 hours, and I, right now, I have 2,000 hours on the books, are you going to reduce my sick bank to 720 if this passes? And that's where you stay until you use some of that time? Yes. Okay. Unless. Yes. Unless, unless you say, I don't want to do that. I want to maintain the 2000 and remain eligible for only 20% payout. Okay. So that's what I was looking at, that if an employee agrees with this, this change, as of January 1, if they have more than 720 hours on the books, that's all they're going to see is 720 hours when they start in January. It would actually be, I believe, you know, that people are given 10 days to exercise a choice. And once those 10 days elapse, anyone with a balance exceeding 720 will have that balance paired back to 720, and they will not be able to accrue beyond that. Okay. So, okay. So that we understand that. So they're going to use that. So, and I think 10 days is not enough time. I think 20 is a better number. And are we saying that every one of those 10, 11 people have to let HR know which option they're going to take. But I, I would think that we would make them make a decision that you can't just forget about it and then when you, if you made that change, they're out of luck. The intent of the legislation would be to have a binding documented decision made okay. within 10 or days or another period of time. Okay. Okay. Alderman Kelly. Thank you. So just to clarify what you just said, you're saying that the default, if I don't make a decision, is the pair back to the 720? If I'm one of those employees and I don't make a decision, the default is that you cut me back to the 720. I think the legislation intends to make them make a decision. Mm -hmm. I also think as a matter of practicality, it's a small group. Uh, and <coughs> the reason that this came up uh, with the city engineer, Dukren, was that I communicated mm -hmm. with those employees who had 720 and said, 
this will be par if, if the if the police commission's version were to have amended this resolution and passed people who have more than 720 hours would have that paired back they know that and we would have to document <coughs> we would have to document their decision but the probability is well over 90 percent that one person will choose to keep their current balance and the rest will that may change. Mm -hmm. it, for which the reason is obvious it costs it's it, you increase the liability to the city uh, by over a hundred thousand dollars by amending your original proposal and the proposal that mayor Doncher speaks in favor of so. okay so alderman kelly anything else Okay, so I'm going to throw the next question out at you. We make this change and come January 1st. I only have 500 hours on the books. I'm not going to 720 in January. I'm staying at 500, right? We're not pushing anybody. We're not giving anybody anything. We might take away some hours if you have a lot of them, but I don't think that we're going to bring everybody to 720. But we're not going to make any adjustments. Okay. All, all employees will accrue uh, 13 days per year. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, any other questions? I just want to make sure everybody understands we're not giving anybody anything else. We now don't have that bank that Mayor, you and I talked about. I think with the majority of them going back to being able to accumulate up to 700 in 20 days, I think it's less liability to the city than uh, a liability, but that's just me and thinking of all these high numbers uh, of hours that some employees already have. Oh, Madam Chair, may I offer one more comment? Sure, Mayor. Uh, someone said that uh, the legal department has pointed out that the city has no legal obligation to those who have already retired. That is correct, but we also have no legal obligation to give away this 100000 or 179,000 or whatever we're giving away here. Um, this is not a legal requirement. Uh, the only thing that anyone would have any argument that they might be entitled to from a legal perspective would be what we agreed to, which was they got what they earned, they get what they earned, as of the date the benefits were changed. Okay. I agree. I agree. That's, but the committee uh, makes the final decision as a group. So um, I feel that the information that you got from the uh, personnel advisory board, uh, you've had time to think about that. You've read the changeovers that. Um, were requested from the last meeting, one of them being uh, that the employee will have the choice of either or. Uh, so now, uh, what is your pleasure on continuing with uh, this piece of legislation? What do you want to do? Alderman Wilshire. I want to move it forward to the full board. Uh, final passage as amended. Okay. Um, I would ask if you're going to do that, if you could amend it further that they get 20 business days to make that decision rather than 10. But uh, I'll, I'll add that to my motion. Okay. <coughs> amend the 10 days to 20. Okay. So you heard the motion. Um, is there any further discussion? 
concerning. Okay. Um, I know, Mayor, that we have no legal obligation to this, but as an employer, I think we have a moral obligation to these 10, 11 people who were like put in a dump and left there. They were put in the basket and they should have been grandfathered along with everyone else that was working prior to July of 2001. Um, and I hope that um, everyone understands that we're trying to rectify this and uh, we'll move it forward to, depending on the vote, uh, to the Board of Aldermen and hopefully we'll have uh, a good outcome. So if there's no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion as amended for uh, legislation R-18-066. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is passed. Thank you. Okay, do we have any discussion? Thank you for coming, uh, Mayor and Mr. Boudreaux. Thank you. Any discussion? Did you have your hand up, Alderman Kelly? Yes? Yes. I'm okay, sorry. I was Alderman to Kelly. I was, <laughs> I was like, I know I had a remark. Um, I just wanted to put it out there that I think that the city charter ordinance, ordinance change and how we fill the remaining boards should just be very well communicated because I mean, we had a lot of questions in this um, in this cha chamber, so I know that voters will have a lot of questions too, so I just want to make sure they're fully understanding of what this change is when it gets in front of them. Alderman Lopez. I second that um, because in the past when we put out um, charter amendments or not even not even charter amendments, just uh, um, can't even think of the word, but the whole performing arts center thing, it really needs to be clear to people what they're being asked to decide on and why. And I mean, a lot of times I think we carry the assumption that they're probably watching the meeting or fully informed, but two thirds of the city just lives their life and doesn't know what this is about. And I think it's very necessary. I think it's it's an element that's that's needed to save money and provide a practical response to things. Um, but just because I think that doesn't mean that everybody else like knows that that's why we're doing it. And it could very easily be misconstrued as a power grab or some kind of offense to de democracy. So I think it's really important for the city to communicate this clearly to people. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Can I re respond Kelly. back to <laughs> I just wanted to respond back that I'm not sure what that form that takes, but I know that other places sometimes clarify it above the ballot, like right on the ballot, so it's a little bit more in layman's terms. So, I mean, I'm happy to chat with the city clerk and 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 help. Communications is what I what I do, so I want to make sure it's it's clear to people what they're Absolutely. what they're choosing. Can we have Attorney Bolton do like a radio show circuit. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> this is what we're doing like now. A plan. So there's no public here, so no comment. Any more remarks from the alderman? Alderman Lopez. I have a remark. Um, so the ordinance that I was sponsoring regarding the farmer's market or street vendors, um, I didn't get a chance to speak on it, which was an unfortunate byproduct of immediately moving to table. But my purpose in putting that forward and also inviting the city clerk to be here to speak on it was because I was approached by several members of the community in May regarding this and started to communicate with different city departments and was, in my opinion, being stonewalled and not responded to. Um, when I did finally start to meet with city departments, um, I found varying uh, degrees of interest and support, but not a lot of inter interdepartmental conversation regarding it. And um, when I spoke to Director Cummings, he indicated he'd actually been working on this since last December. So this was in July. All of August and September passed, and I, I made a point of it when I had put a proposal on the Board of Aldermen meeting for the very beginning of September that didn't make it to the agenda that this is a conversation and a discussion that really should be happening in public and with some transparency because it affects a lot of commerce and a lot of activity. We've had a very successful farmer's market season, but my intention wasn't in fact to have specifically the farmer's market be the beneficiary. I think that got inferred because there have been one-on-one -on -one conversations 
And things are a little bit more clear when you have them on the record as part of the committee. So while I appreciate um, the city clerk's willingness to meet with me and talk to me more about refining this and, and working on it, and I have no doubt that she'll probably do a very good job, I think the conversation, the full conversation, should be happening at this committee meeting so that people can see the reasoning and the understanding behind changes and so that people can really understand where each other is coming from because the city departments have a lot of other stuff going on. Um, I know the city clerk's office just went through a, a really difficult election, and I know that the economic development office has been trying really hard to produce results for the Performing Arts Center presentation. So there's going to be a lot of other priorities, and one-on-one, -on -one, I feel like the city departments may have to choose which battles they can fight and what they can put time into, whereas if they're coming before a committee and as the authors of legislation, we're able to discuss it, we're able to do our jobs a little bit more clearly. So I just wanted to clarify that that was my role here. I know the legislation isn't perfect, and there's certainly some room for editing, but I wanted to get it on the record so that the conversation could then start. I think that's um, a good point, and I think that after the conversation, if we have it back here in October, yeah, October, November, um, we'll be able to talk about it more in public, and I agree. It should be out there in public, and I'm sure we'll have it all put together in time for January of next year when vendors come forward looking for their... The, uh, I just want to clarify, the farmer's market is one element of it, and that is not on a time crunch. They're right. probably going to start organizing that in January. Right. But so, other things like Christmas tree sales that are recurring or holiday craft fairs, art shows, that kind of stuff, limiting the extension of this to just the farmer's market wasn't really my intention. My intention was to look at vendor fairs and figure out, A, how does an organization that is offering the same event week after week after week not have to continue to supply the exact same information to the city repeatedly? And B, how do we encourage more activity like what we saw with the farmer's market where people are bringing their own you know, small business um, properties into conjunction with each other and creating an ongoing event that brings a lot of attention and traffic to that area? I represent downtown, but I think this is something that could be useful for other areas too. Well, I think that uh, that's a, a piece of conversation that if, uh, like the farmer's market, which goes for 10 weeks, that it's a one-time fee and this is how much it costs rather than doing it every week. And there might be other um, activities that go on that are similar that they might, that would make it easier for the uh, city clerk's office as well. Um, I only have one comment. Um, I'm hoping when this... Um, piece of legislation concerning the sick pay goes before the full board that we have um, positive feedback from this. Um, I think that Alderman Wilshire um, worked very hard uh, meeting with, agreeing to meet with the mayor, trying to get the, the numbers put together, and we're trying to, it's not a legal responsibility, but it's the right thing to do for a group of people that this never should have happened to in the first place. So I'm hoping that it works out. Um, for me, it's a compromise, but it could be a lot of other things too. Um, Alderman so, so Wilshire. Jaren, I had one more comment. I wasn't quite done. Okay, let me get Alderman Wilshire and yeah. Alderman Gathright. I, I was, uh, I wanna say this. Um, you know, typically when a board or commission makes their advisory, granted their advisory, but I mean, as a board, we typically put a lot of weight into what those boards come back to us with, even if they are advisory. I mean, we do that with the community grants. We do that, you know, we, we task those members to making good decisions. I mean, when, when review and comment or community grants comes before us, we don't challenge every decision they've made, or hardly any, for that matter. So, you know, I think the fact, too, that we had the Personnel Advisory Board unanimously behind this says a lot about it. And I, too, want to right or wrong. I think it's the right thing to do. So, Okay. Alderman Gathright. Um, I just want to say that, I, you know, I sat in on it before, and I'm... Um, sort of happy that, you know, the decision was made today, you know, to move forward with it. Um, but 
as a city or as, um, as a city servant, it bothers me when we think of um, our employees that we, we can just change everything at will. And usually it's all about money, you know? So I, I feel that um, if we hire people into a position today and you say to them, these are your benefits, then I would expect that for whatever reason we decide to make changes down the line as a city, that we should look at grandfathering those folks. I think it's very wrong. I worked in corporate America for 34 years and would have never done that. So I'm just saying that, you know, I, I heard what our mayor say, but I disagree exactly with what he said. And I'll, I'll and I know he knows me well, so I know he knows how, I, how passionate I am about things like that. You, we have the right to do a lot of things. It doesn't make it right. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I feel about that. But I'm glad that you guys were able to move on and work together and come to some type of conclusion as Thank to what's going next. Alderman Lopez. I just wanted to remind the public, um, this Saturday at 10 a.m., we're going to be meeting at City Hall to do a rail trail cleanup and a library walk cleanup. So please feel free to join so we can get everything ready for the fall. Okay. Anything else? Alderman Gidge. Yes, I, uh, I think it's like a win-win, lose-lose. But when you go back and you say, wait a minute here, this is, this is sort of what we agreed upon. And then someone comes and says, well, I know, but it's going to cost a lot of money. But the people who began at the very beginning under a process, and it goes on for so long, I can see where the mayor is coming from. But occasionally, we just got to take a step back and say, that was wrong, and let's take care of it. <coughs> and yes, it's like it's more emotion than it is almost that it is money. And I think in a sense, Money is very important. The importance of, of this is uh, psychological and right. And yes, sometimes, occasionally, right cost money. Sorry. But it's like giving one's word. Thank you. Alderman Wilshire. So the, the thing that really, for me, started to really set in and was the fact that people that on in 2001 had already earned those benefits they don't they'd already worked and earned that it wasn't a gift it was something they had from the time they started until 2001 they had earned that already and then for the city to go retroactively and take it back just is not the right thing to do okay anything else okay no non-public do i hear a motion Alderman Lopez. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're adjourned at 8.53. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.